Welcome, Mr. Richard Morgan. Hello, and everybody. And welcome Just to... Just for me. And welcome episode number 97. Mm -hmm. um, the song I was just playing was More Than a Feeling by Boston with our famous Tom Scholz. Tom Scholz is a guitar player. I guess he's from Boston. Well, in America, they have always formed the bands from the cities they came from. They do. Yeah, so I assume he's from Boston. <laughs> when it's calling his band Boston, then um, that's the thing. I'm a big fan of that song. I'm a big fan of that man. And tomorrow will be his birthday. So this is why I choose that song. Ah, now it all makes sense. Yeah. Um, Tom Scholz in the band Boston was a very interesting story too because um, he had... It was kind of a studio project. It was him playing organ, uh, guitar, I think the drums somebody else played and the singer was somebody else, but he did all the rest and also the mixing. So he he's kind of a engineer in the studio, a musician, a composer, a ranger, and the guy behind the knobs. And the guy behind the famous Tom Scholz rock man. I, have you heard one of those? No. Uh, this this is, was before you. I, I don't know if it was before me. It probably was, but I just, I'm not familiar with it at all. Ah. I realized when you were playing that song that mm -hmm. it's a legendary guitar track, mm -hmm. but I've never heard the song in its entirety before today. And that made me think, is that where Kurt Cobain got the Smells Like Teen Spirit riff from? Because it the really room. sounds yeah. similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I only know the chorus from More Than A Feeling. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I, that I guess riff so. Yeah, yeah. Dong, 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 I mean, you know, who, who? I mean, it's all coming from somewhere. Yeah, it smells like a teen spirit, and the rhythm is uh, is catchy. It's a catchy rhythm because it's propelling forward. Bam, gadam, dum, dum. You know, uh, Tom Schultz plays dum, bam, dum, dum, dum. But it's very similar. So, what was this rock man then? Ah. Back in the days, when you had, um, Tom Schultz was using Marshalls, as most rock guitar players were. And here in the picture, we can see also the power soak. He invented the power soak because that device was the load resistor that brought down the output voltage of a Marshall. So that turned the signal coming from the speaker out into heat and um, reducing that output voltage kind of to the ground with a big load resistor. And there was kind of a switch in the middle that could deduct the volume or the voltage um, by a certain amount of steps. And um, so that was first his way how to tame the marshal so it wasn't too loud. And the other thing, we see beside it is that pocket thing. Back in in this in in these days, um, we had uh, what was it? The Discman and the um, the Walkman. Sony invented the Walkman, which was um, a thing to listen music with cassettes when you went jogging. <laughs> <laughs> This was before your time, right? No, I remember the Walkman. Ah, you remember? My parents had them. Okay, your parents had them. Okay, yeah. cool. So I remember when something like that came out, a portable device mm. that was playing music. You could, you know, go. You were totally hip. You know, today everybody has phones and smart. And it's so easy. But back in the days, this was the hottest shit ever. And then Tom Schultz came out with a Rockman. I had one. I was, of course, I had to have a Rockman. It was a transistor, overdrive, and delay, and chorus. I mean, chorus, back in the days. This was the hottest effect ever. And it all came in a portable box that you could kind of slide on the guitar strap, have the headphones, you could walk around in the garden and practice. And my personal opinion is the sound is kind of very recognizable. The downside is, no matter what you plug in there, if it's a Strat or Les Paul, it all sounds the same. <laughs> <laughs> Which was kind of cool in a way, because we all had 
the old school amps and then you had this kind of plastic box with that sound that everybody had and then you were kind of part of that studio guys that had the rock tone, you know. But was it at least a good sound? I would say it was not very dynamic and not very uh. personal, but it was a good sound. It worked because, I mean, Tom Scholz knew that it needs a certain kind of mid-range and stuff um, to cut through the mix. It was basically a Marshall-esque transistor overdrive and the effects were high-tech at the time. I mean, having it in a portable thing, battery-powered with headphones, but... With today's standards, I would say, mm, yeah. Ah, I see a comment here, the Noble Studio One was a, comp, uh, a, a, comp, a copy or comp, competitor of that um, rock man. Ah, there you go. And Mario says that Joe Satriani recorded a lot with it. Sure. Not of this earth and surfing with the alien, yeah. the Rockman. Yeah, there so you go. it's an iconic tone. Mm -hmm. I, I had one, I, I was recording... Um, at Frank Farian, Bonnie M producer studio, and I was kind of the first guy that came in with a Rockman. And we were like, wow, what's that? No amp. And <laughs> I was into having scary new shit back in the days. Even, even. Yeah. And Tom Scholz, for me, is kind of, mm, besides um, Les Paul, one of the, the few people that are actually both musicians and engineers, mm -hmm. in a way. That's my... I'm, I, I'm kind of the same, you know, I spend at least that much time fiddling around with gear, testing, designing, and whatnot. And I've always done that. It, it was even before I started playing the guitar, I, I, I've done the electronics. And... Um, I, I guess people like Tom Scholz are the same kind of um, spirit or mindset. Yeah. And what I like about Tom Scholz is that he came up with groundbreaking new ideas. I mean, to have an idea for a portable device, it's an abstract thing. It's like, okay, on the one hand, I know my great old Marshalls that I play with my Les Paul, blah, blah, Tom Scholz now. And now how to get this into this new world of people having Walkmans, you know, walk around and have their tone with me. I still, I stole that idea from the Walkman into the Tube Man, because it's like, okay, he did the Rockman, and I thought, hey, I want to take my Tube sound, so I came up with the Tube Man. Yeah, of course, in 19... Hey, maybe this was even 92. Uh, but the Scholz, Tom Scholz Rockman is, is, is older than 197. Okay, we have to check that. If somebody knows when it came out, I'm sure I didn't inv invent the tube man before the Rockman. If so, I, I claim to be a clever guy. <laughs> <laughs> but my feeling is more like uh, I'm not, I wasn't that clever. It was more like a logical thing that it was around in yeah. the air, you know, just, you know. Painting by numbers, like, oh, okay. Okay, now we complete the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, the Rockman have a speaker? Or could no, you put headphones into it? Head, oh, headphones. Okay. Mm -hmm. And to make it more nice for your ears, that's why they put um, the effects in there. Ah, okay. Yeah. And um, by the way, there's a nice gentleman, uh, Bobby Cedro, who's now working for um, Jim Dunlop, company i'm still in contact with him to say he was working for tom scholz back then and uh, people in the industry we all on the same planet you know it's like it's such a nice small industry yeah and on the other hand guys when we talk about power so everybody you know reactive load and all that stuff today tom scholz was the first one that put it on the map. Probably he invented it, maybe if he wasn't doing it, but he put it out as a product. As a, He was the first one to have a load box or a power attenuator. I haven't seen anything before Tom Scholz like that. There was nothing. So big, big respect, Tom Scholz and 
tomorrow he's the birthday boy man. <laughs> he is. With, uh, I don't know, 70 some years. But he, he, he's, he looks young and fit and uh, I saw some interviews with him. He seems to be a very humble and nice guy. Yeah. You don't know him personally? No, unfortunately no. never met him. But maybe you can, if, if he sees me, let's meet at NEM or wherever. I would love to have a chat with him. That's, uh, yeah, especially behind the scenes kind of stuff that uh, would be interesting for me. Yeah, and um, I came up with a song idea because I picked up that guitar that you played a couple of times, mm -hmm. which is my um, Les Paul Deluxe. I guess it's this 1971 and it has a refret. So I went to a very nice gentleman near Mannheim in Frankdal, <laughs> uh, which is um, an hour drive from Saarbrücken. And he, I asked him to do the refret with my um, 6105 style frets, which I like on basically any guitar yeah. from strats. Two Les Pauls. They are uh, medium jumbos, a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. And um, man, I'm. There's so much more definition in that guitar. Maybe you can hear it, but um, we haven't changed anything else. So it's the same guitar. Do you know if the frets that were on there before were the original yes. frets? Yeah. So the frets were what? 50, 50 years old. Yeah, they were that old, yeah. and the frets were the wider Gibson, whatever, trapez, uh, I don't know what, 61 or 100, the, yeah. the, the, the jumbo frets. Yeah. But for me, For me, the, the tone is more defined. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about that guitar. I, I remember how it sounded before and after. And uh, the, the tone is more precise. And okay, it's a mini humbucker guitar. Anyway, I think mini humbuckers are, are way underrated. Some people go, oh, if it's not a puff, it's not. I have my other Les Paul with a PF style pickups or the puffs, also great guitar, um, but um, mini humbuckers. Let's pull with mini humbug. Listen to that. I mean, there's a lot of clarity. I give you a little crunch tone here with well, okay. <laughs> There's no 50 wiring. This is the standard wiring. Maybe I changed that, but the guitar, wow. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, I like mini humbuckers as well. Mm -hmm. I actually got sent fairly recently a vintage guitar with uh. Wilkinson mini humbuckers in it. And it's, it's different, you know, it's not a single coil. Yeah. 
but it has that precision and clarity. Yeah. It's not a full-size humbucker. It's clearer than a humbucker. Yes. It's it's somewhere in the middle and really, really underrated. I, I, I fully, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I fully love the fact because there's nothing wrong about humbuckers and single coils, but sometimes you look for the thing in the middle and it's either P90s mm -hmm. or the mini humbuckers. Yep. And nobody talks about mini humbuckers these days. And that's the point why... We should talk about them more. <laughs> we should. Yeah. Um, I filmed a little clip when um, picking up the, this guitar at Andreas Lang, that's his name, um, workshop. So you can see and smell uh, how it is in a German guitar luthiers workshop from Andreas Lang. Check that out. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, my beautiful guitar and the Meister himself. Yes, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> now you're on TV. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, this is Andreas Lang's workshop. Please have a look. Tons of great stuff, the real deal. Oh, a Gretsch guitar. Gretsch. Who cares? A Gretsch is a Gretsch. Okay. Wow, and here, just one more extra room. I'm impressed. So let's have a look. Let's have a look on the on the fret drop. Yeah. Yeah. So ah. and a new new bone. New bone. The old bone. For the collectors. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't he? Beautiful. Hey, thanks so much. And this is the Meister. <laughs> Hello, Andreas. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, as you can see, the guitar. And he changed also uh, the bone nut. He put a, a, you know, I mean, look at this, how smooth that feels. Huh? Yeah, very the, nicely done. Yeah. yeah. So this is not a... Uh, no, he, he, he puts some love into the guitar and you can tell how the edges are and it's yeah. smooth and, and every man as well, right? Yeah. Taking on a refret job with a 50 year old Gibson, not everyone would do it. And I guess you wouldn't trust every luthier with that job. Exactly. And therefore, I mean, I know a few guys that can do it, um, but I have seen other guitars that he has done for friends of mine where I was so impressed that I said, okay, now. I have to check him out. And this was kind of the first time. I knew the guy from back in the days and stuff like that, but this was like, this fret job, yeah. And I was, I'm totally happy. This is, yeah, and the, puts the guitar back into my first top 10. Yeah, I like it. Um, by the way, maybe we can compare the two guitars, like the mini humbuckers versus the PAF. Yeah, let's do it. And I would love to explain a little bit about the, the sounds of what I used for more than the feeling at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I show you what I've done. Everything on full and... I had a boost. The boost was on. Uh, the original is played on an acoustic guitar and mm -hmm. electric guitar and mm -hmm. overdubs because the guy is a studio genius. He knows how to make arrangements back in the 70s. This is why Tom Scholz is such a great man. And we could read in the comments that Tom Scholz worked on the first prototypes of the Rockman in 82. And the Tube Man came out in 91. So, yeah, I remember, remember co correctly that I was just kind of following the numbers. Yeah, not quite the first, <laughs> but no, almost. No. Yeah. I was too young back then, too. Anyway. So, um, so the, the thing here about uh, the guitar the setting is um, clean volume on five, boost on one o'clock, and now comes the, the big thing, mids all the way up. 
I'm still on my stack 1970, uh, mm -hmm. but Tom Scholz, the mids is the secret. You need mids, middle control. So you're all the way up to 10 on the mids? Yeah. Okay, other guys can see that at home, yeah. Yeah, so all the way around 10. And the bass actually is kind of reduced to, where is it, three or something. That's not so important, but important is that you crank the mids. Travel is kind of in the middle and that's doing it. And uh, for this more sparkle, I put the clean tone on full. And, uh... That's played with the fingers and with the pick. That's just a nice sparkly clean tone, but with still some meat and dynamics. Yeah. And both pickups on the guitar. Yeah. 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 Neck only, bridge only. But it's giving you this more acoustic kind of thing. Because there is no acoustic guitar on the backing track. Yeah. Um, so, and then when I went for the rhythm jong uh, I went to the vintage channel, which I actually did with a foot switch here, on the bridge. This is turning down the volume. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the solo on the classic just to have a bit more volume mm -hmm. and a, a bit more gain but he wouldn't do that he would probably fine-tune the tone control to make it the mid more focused let's go for the for the for the vintage <laughs> That's his thing to, to focus the mids with any, anything he gets. And he's getting also this nice feedback, blah, blah, blah. Um, just to compare the mini humbuckers versus my older Les Paul. And what year is this one? It's a 68, I think. It's the, somebody told me with this, what is it, crown inlay or mm -hmm, yep. there's a name for it. 50s wiring, which I prefer because more colors when you turn down the uh, volume control. But <laughs> full humbuckers are actually, I would change the settings already. They are too, too big. Yeah, so what would you do? I would reduce the gain just to show. at least a number 
I think I was on eight, now I'm seven, or that, that, that helps. <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe we compare it just one more time so we know. This one for you. Versus mini humbuckers. First without the adjustment. These are already snappy ones, yeah. you know, because I love that. And the mini humbuckers have that by nature. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's the, the Les Paul uh, new fret drop part. <laughs> um, but the other day I thought, episode 97, there was something with 97. And it was kind of one of my biggest years in my Philo facts. In your Philo facts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyone still remember what a Philo facts was? <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the comments if you had a Philo facts. Yes, please. <laughs> well, um, the German word is a, a little ringbuch, uh, you know, where you, have, you can put in slices of paper where you had a calendar. And then, um, you know, you, you could pretend to be a very well-organized pro musician or whatever. It was usually the businessman's thing. You, you came with your file effects, something like that, put it on a table so that this was the claim of... Hey, I'm professional, and by the way, um, I have no time tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, but what happened in my life in 1997, 90, 9, 1997, mm -hmm. okay, yes, was quite a lot. Um, so one thing was I was uh, touring with Tic Tac Toe, the biggest gigs ever in my life. I was releasing um, the first album with my three-piece German band Dreist. Um, what else? I had guested on other, uh, yeah, on other musicians like Uwe Ochsenknecht album that came out that year, um, and what? And my second solo album came out. So, 1997. Yeah, a big year. Yeah. 25 years ago this year. See? Getting old. <laughs> but um, maybe it was worth, or maybe it is worth to look back uh, at where I was back in time and how things were back in time. Well, the whole thing also came along because I, I'm, I met a, a good, good old friend of mine who lives now in Berlin, Peter Hayu, who is a producer who hired me many times for No Angels and stuff like that. And we had kind of a blind faith relationship in, in the studio. I recorded, recorded my first, first solo album, The Beauty of Simplicity, at his place. I was... Well, we had a great night. We the night was three in the morning. But anyway, um, wait, was this a night in ninety seven or was this last week? Last week. All right. Okay. <laughs> so that that brought back a lot of memories. You know, this is why I decided 
maybe we have the 1997 uh, episode today. Mm, okay. And Peter, um, he is still using uh, uh, running a studio in Berlin now. Back in the days, he used to to be. Uh, he has had his own studio, and when I recorded my first solo record, I wasn't happy with the guitar tone. So I went. He told me stories I forgot about. Like in the middle of the recording, he, I was leaving the studio, going to the car, getting a new speaker in a box. Um, and back then we didn't have the electrical uh, things to drill with a regular screwdriver, change the speaker, <laughs> put it back in place, move the microphone, said, Peter, okay, now I'm ready. Now the tone is right. <laughs> Stuff like that. Or we came... We had stories, unbelievable stories. There, were, there was a studio, uh, we worked together and um, kind of we had a, a break for, for having dinner and um, there was a bobtailed dog who was blind. So every time we recorded there, the, the dog sometimes knocked over, knocked on your amp and you know stuff like that. And then while having dinner, having the break, uh, we came back and the, the mix sounded totally crap. So the cat was moving on the, on, on the <laughs> mixing desk, you know, and of course, boop, faders have been changed by the cats, you know, buttons has be, have been pressed because, funny, the cat, you know, jumped on the mixing console <laughs> by accident. Another time we came back from dinner and then the strings were gone, no strings anymore, because the guy who ran the studio, um, um, sold eight channel strips while we had dinner. <laughs> and so there was a, a big hole in the console. <laughs> Stuff like that. Killer stories. And anyway, um, so we had a great time and I was having memories of what happened, you know, 25 years ago. And I had an Audi A6, the bigger one, um, uh, saloon. Saloon. Okay, saloon. Yeah. <laughs> Estate for British English people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, combi for the German people. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course, everybody, when I was driving to gigs, was jumping in my car because we had a bit, little bit more room than a regular, uh, what hatch, hatchback or hatchback. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, you know, it was more like a flea market with five, five people <laughs> and a lot of things in, in the back. And um, yeah, but OK, we had this, these times. Um, maybe we start with the biggest thing, because that year I was in tic-tac-toe and that was Germany's biggest pop act. Um, well, let me just mention to the guys, if yeah. you want more stories about this tour specifically, the yeah. Tic-Tac-Toe stuff and 97, last week in Academy of Tone 96, you had another special guest, Ali Neander. Yeah. You discussed it a bit. Yeah. So if you want to go and watch that afterwards, feel free. It's sure. still on our YouTube channel. Yeah. But yeah, did you discuss in that story last week how you came to join Tic-Tac-Toe? No. Did you tell that story? Maybe no. you could tell that now how it how it sort of started okay actually we should do a full episode how to get along in the music business because that was the perfect example i was um to cut it short in a way last episode there was ali ali neander who uh, hired me as his sub in a um in a band of edu zanki who who is kind of a, a german soul guy unfortunately he passed away of cancer a few years ago and I had to play Ali's job because he had a double booking and he needed a sub. So I prepared well, I did uh, the rehearsal and then I I wanted to rehearse more and, uh, and Edu Zanki, uh, the, the boss, the singer said, uh, this guy is great, let's have some ice cream. <laughs> and then the next thing is was I was on German television with him. And I never played the whole set with the band. Never ever. Only in front of the running cameras in television. Okay, f fine enough. So next day after this, of course, I didn't play with uh, Edu Zanke anymore because this was Ali's job. But uh, Purple Schulz is, is a German um, 
uh, singer, songwriter, also very famous back in the days. And he was looking for a new guitar player. And he knew e Edo. So he called Edo and Edo said, yeah, there was this guy that came in, knew everything, was cool, smart. You should uh, hire him. So that was second level. Then Purple, I was hired by Purple Schulz. I auditioned and uh, I had to sing. Oh my God, oh, BB only, but I... I, I did my very best, and I'm actually I'm not so good. But Purple, you know, he, he was with his left hand writing like this. Tief hinten rein, bis hinten rein, oder? Sing, sing, can you sing that? And I said, oh, brilliant. Okay, five part harmony. I'm not the best in this, you know. Anyway, I did, I did fine, and I played with Purple Schulz for... Ugh. 95, 94, 95, 96, up until 97, because here's the thing, the drummer of Purple Schulz was Wolf Simon, and Wolf got this uh, thing of this new German Spice Girls rap band, and we were good buddies in Purple Schulz, and we played together, so um, he recommended me to play for tic-tac-toe. There was an audition. And at the audition there were some other German, famous German people that didn't make it. The good story is one of the, the, the guy for the keyboards, the audition was one of my friends that I brought in who didn't get it. Um, Ralf Erkel, who did get the job. And the third one was Christoph Kemper. The guy who was, oh, okay. yeah, he auditioned for that band and he didn't get a job, but he made his money doing profiling apps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you see how yeah. this industry is so small and so, you know, unbelievably connected. Um, because, well, he's kind of from the area where that band came from. Uh, officially, the band was never casted, it was kind of a whatever natural. Total bullshit, the band was casted because <laughs> I'm maybe have 10 lawyers now on my, but who cares? Um, there was a, a great management. In case you want to sue me, I call you great. And <laughs> an even better producer, um, Thorsten Berger. Um, he didn't live off burgers, <laughs> he lived off potatoes because he didn't have much money. Um, potatoes and sour cream for years and he was one of those guys like a Frankenstein he created music everything he was the producer he wrote all the music and basically everything it was kind of a one-man show with three female casted singer rappers whatever uh, nobody had a singer career before that <laughs> but they were cool cool girls and was it like, you mentioned the Spice Girls, but it, for, for anybody like me who didn't grow up in Germany or anything, yeah. you will have no idea who Tic Tac Toe was. Are they, are they like, is this Tic, Tac and Toe, by the way? <laughs> Do they have names? or They have names, but this is... Um, or is that Lee, just the name of the band? Ah, right, yeah, okay. Then, it's, yeah. it's, 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 they, they, you know, they came up with real girls and Tic Tac Toe, and, but they have real names, no? Ricky, later on, Ricky became famous for being Ricky's Pop Sofa because, hallo, ich bin die Ricky, ich bin immer auf dem Pop Sofa, oh, mir geht's so gut. Um, this is Ricky, by the way. Beautiful. And uh, <laughs> Marlene Tackenberg in German, um, artist named Jesse, and Lee. Lee, I had a very, very nice um, <clears throat> two stories. One story is at the rehearsals, um, she found out and when she was looking at my gear and, you know, changing the settings on my amp or on my pedal board, I was getting nervous. So that grabbed the attention and it came to the point where I had a, a very shitty sound, you know, being the hired gun for a, a, a band that, you know, Soon after was opening up for Michael Jackson and uh, Sting, 
and playing out of the green in, in, in Switzerland and festivals and doing a, a, a huge tour. So I knew that thing is going to be big. And she was getting girly style in, you know, trying to get me, I don't know what, uh, just grab the attention and and then one day I had to at, at, at rehearsal she did something I grabbed her and put her on the floor I said hey if you do that again <laughs> <laughs> and I did this to the leader of the singers so to speak you know but I had to make clear this is here's the limit come on and the whole thing the band was totally hyped in the media because of many things. Um, one thing you have to understand, in Germany they, they were singing German lyrics and this was the first time the language was changed into um, Ich find die scheiße oder so richtig scheiße oder you know, something like that. Die Scheiße ist richtig uh, uh, Ja, I, ich finde. Uh, what's the pro proper English translation for Ich finde die Scheiße? I think you suck. Yeah. So, so. I think you're shit. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You would never get away with that in the, in the UK or American charts, I don't think. Yeah. Especially not in the 90s. Yeah. And this was the thing they did. They were abandoned on the charts, but. The young female audience loved it so much, it was kind of under the media and they became so big that the fans actually made the band so big that the radio had to play that. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the novelty. That was the new level and with, with a lot of topics that were important, kind of Emancipation, emancipation, emancipation. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, of female, young females. This was very important for them. It meant a lot. So, um, two aspects. Maybe for the guys that don't know tic tac toe, we have a little video that we can show you, so you get some impressions of that first, and then we talk sound and gear and men's talk. But first. See what, what was going on there. Die Tic Tac Toe Cam, sozusagen mit den Augen von Tic Tac Toe. Kraft zum Durchhalten bekommt die Band von ihren Fans, die vom ersten Augenblick an hinter ihnen standen und mit transparenten Briefen und Faxen versichern, wir halten zu euch. Die Presse kippt, immer mehr Medien stellen sich auf die Seite von Tic-Tac-Toe und die Mädchen müssen sich immer noch auf das Wesentliche konzentrieren, jeden Abend eine gute Show für ihre Fans zu machen. Nein, ich möchte mich gerne bedanken, entschuldigt. Ich möchte mich gerne bei dem ganzen Publikum, bei meinen Fans, bzw. unseren Fans und die Leute, die nicht unsere Fans sind, bedanken dafür, dass sie hinter uns stehen. Deswegen wollte ich Ruhe haben. Wir kennen uns seit Jahren, sind zusammen abgefahren, uns gehörte die Welt und dafür brauchen wir kein Geld.
Ja. <laughs> und warum, und warum? <laughs> It was fun. It was proper band music um, because the producer Thorsten Berger, um, he was. I, I liked his co compositions, and um, he was also guitar player. So, were, were you coming up with guitar parts, or did he provide them and you fine tune them? Or? Yeah, he, yeah. he. It was his project, you know. Uh, um, of course, he respected because I could do. A lot of things he couldn't do, but he he's he had a brain. He has had the overall concept, and uh, yeah, brilliant guy and minimalistic. That was his thing. Uh, actually, have high respect for what he has done because he had. Ah, uh, where's my ES three thirty five? Is upstairs. He had a three thirty five. He had a just very. The whole production thing was a Mackie board, one sampler, one reverb just nothing and he made millions if we look at the charts um, of the year 97 we can see how how big that band was i think there was two number one hits in the charts at the same time like uh, in the same year one number one for seven weeks and then the next number one came two weeks later for another five weeks or so and then there was a number 10 with the third song in the German top 100 charts and then there was another single on 78 or whatever so it was like unbelievably uh, present in the media. What was it like for you being in that kind of storm of <laughs> chart success? It was it was interesting because I knew the business before because I played with Purple Jewels and with the Rainbirds and uh, Planet Claire and I worked with producers so I knew the business um, but the the amount of glamour Gloria and um, media power that's this is what what I learned there was a, a um, there was a, a tragic story Lee was married the media didn't know that and um, she officially said she wasn't married and the guy had a big problem with that nobody knew that we didn't know one day the guy committed suicide so the media discovered a guy hanging and then this was like shit how do we gonna react to that this was in the middle of a rehearsal we didn't know but the management knew so the the only thing that they, they told us is pack your gear we sent you a fax. Back then we had fax. <laughs> fax. Where to meet? Because we were in the middle of the rehearsal. We knew the tour was coming. But they said, don't open the door. Bild Zeitung, the German yellow press, will be knocking on your door. We knew that. Pack, pack up your stuff right now. Drive home. Any guy that, answer, uh, that, that calls you or is on your door, don't let him in. Don't tell them nothing. You don't know where you're going because we don't tell you where to go. We tell you in advance. We, we send you the date of wherever we, we start the tour. It was not known. So they, 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 had, they had shifted the tour and stuff. Like the tour was already sold out. So there was this drama by 10. <laughs> and anyway, so I was driving home and okay, I'm in this band and What's going on? When I came home on television, I could see the whole story. And then, of course, bomb, there was full media, everything. And then, you know, there was a picture of me and Lee um, in, in the Bravo magazine, which is the, you know, girly paper for teenagers. And uh, Tic Tac Thomas, Lee's new boyfriend, you know, because there was a picture that looked like that and they made up the story you know <laughs> so okay I had big fun because I, I knew there was no you know this was only media, media but I could see how the power of media and fake news actually 
what what we to have today this was also new before that i never felt of fake news or stuff like that but this happened and this was actually moving masses and uh yeah so unbelievable um of course i knew it was just the band that i was the tour uh, or their guitar player and this um it's not my band whatever happens well in the end after a super successful year the band split up because the girls had too much tension within those three they they split up in front of in front of running cameras on television and people thought that would be a joke but this was the truth and then they had like millions of t-shirts and merch that couldn't be sold anymore because the band broke up you know and then we had to get our salary for for the tour and maybe the next tour which was planned you know this was to 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 be the, the press conference for the the next concerts and we played already arenas unbelievable so and this this was it and then i had to sue mama concerts and rau which did the michael jackson thing because that company paid us this is where i learned about legal stuff <laughs> because we had that um we went uh, to court and with our contract and said the contract says we have done this many con uh, concerts and there's a few more and the promoter guarantees for so many contracts and it's clear words guarantees i was proud of my word guarantee mm. i put it in there it was hard uh negotiations i remember that oh this was zurich in in switzerland and the band was behind scenes we 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 told them we are not going on stage unless you sign this contract now or there is no band tonight <laughs> so it was it was drama on everything and then of course somebody signed and we all smiled and went on stage and stuff like that but this is behind the scenes you know audience never knows that but um it talks for hours you know it's like oh uh, your 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 brain already fried before you play the first note yeah but backstage anyway we had that that signature and this was uh yeah dramatic times but well back to the lawsuit um we won first then mama concerts and rao with a list of lawyers longer than the, the paper <laughs> okay more lawyers <laughs> um they they went into the the, the next level on court mm -hmm. like an appeal yeah and they won there fuck mm -hmm. and now we have to pay all these lawyers and then i had to have another extra lawyer on top of the lawyer that we had before and then with our super clever double lawyer team <laughs> we managed at the bayerische oberverwaltungsgericht the highest court a thing can go like that in the third instance what is it uh, the third level i don't even yeah, know it, it it's the last yeah. it's the last yeah like the the equivalent of the supreme court or whatever yeah. the last hearing the, yeah. yeah so the last hearing and this we won again and then we had the money for the band and uh, yeah this this was this was kind of that thing behind the scene and did you regret that the band broke up was the more planned was it going to get bigger or did, did, did you have thoughts about the future from your side well from my side i was i was just a guitar player uh, and whatever was the decision of the management would have been the stuff you know i i could only talk to them and they would make the decision whatever they would do um they were intelligent people so they had open ears and uh but the industry you know th this was um or oh, what was the company bmg maybe i think it was bmg uh, you know i met all the bosses of the record companies uh and we had dinner i mean dinner because they made millions if you go for dinner with them just the starter is the price of a family dinner for the rest of 
you know, when you have, when you marry or something like this. I mean, this was the really posh and I've, I've seen the best hotels. I've seen, the, you know, the, all that. I've been there. I mean, if you are on tour with Michael Jackson and, and those guys having three number one hits in Germany, the dinner is not a currywurst. <laughs> <laughs> Oder Schnieposa, Schnitzel, Pommes, Salat. <laughs> Do you still have contact with any of them, the no. three singers or any of the other musicians now? Actually not, because it was so bizarre. Um, after that, there was a reunion. I was part of that, of the big break, with a, another third girl called Sarah, Sarah. And, oh, coming back memories. Falco, we all know Amadeus, Amadeus. So I repaired Falco's bass. Uh, he was in Hamburg in the studio and Falco is actually a good bass player or used to be a good bass player. And Falco, um, yeah, I mean, he, he had all these alcohol problems and drug problems and whatever. And then he died somewhere in the Caribbean. And then um, the producer, Thorsten Berger, produced um, Falco's last hit single. So, and Falco came to our concerts. So I met Falco in Vienna and we have the, the full nine yards after show party with Doro film. Doro was uh, the film crew that did uh, Queen. Um, and they're, you know, you, you, nice guys. Um, but, you know, there's original paintings by Charlie Watts and Ron Wood and, you know, because they are all working with them and hey, this is whatever, Freddie Mercury's blah, blah, blah. And you go there and there's the swimming pool and there's Falco and there's this uh, whatever, happiness, drugs, anything. You, it's just like you, you know it from the movies. It's that bad, <laughs> but it's, this is how it is. Okay, anyway, end of tour story. We all ended up in the pool um, and of course, there would be tons of pictures that could be great for Bravo again for new stories just because of everybody drunk, end of story, uh, end of tour, having fun and the footage from that party would be, could fill legendary magazines. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just fun and nothing, nothing, nothing uh, real, nothing I was always totally grounded, knowing this was just a pop job bubble and I play my role in there. And when I go to this kind of superstar party with the superstars, talking to Falco, hey man, smoking and you know, whatever. And yeah, it's cool, you know, nice guys. And so, um, yeah, this <laughs> it was, a, of course, the industry had the plans um, and if they wouldn't uh, uh, stop at that point, there would at least be a, a year or two of huge success because uh, the lyrics was the key that meant so much to these young uh, girls. The audience was all young girls, all screaming louder than the Beatles. <laughs> it's like, if I'm talking age of starting from 8 to whatever, 16 or something, all girls, 10,000 in one hall. And when we came on stage, the first, the first line was already fading away because of the excitement, getting no air. They, they had uh, oxygen masks uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, sanitator, um, uh, medicine, uh, people, what is it, Doc, uh, sanitator, the, the guys that... Oh, like the ambulance group. Am Ambulance, yeah. yeah. There was no gig without amb ambulance yeah. because uh, the girls screamed. And it, it, was, it was an important thing for them. Yeah. And um, you, Audi Avant, yeah, Hardy O. Yes, I had the Audi Avant, five-cylinder diesel, 2.5 liters. Actually a good car because five cylinders doesn't take too much fuel. Great in today's <laughs> fuel prices. Yeah, perfect if it still runs, yeah. yeah. I recommended that car to my dentist 
and his one is still running because he wasn't driving as much as I was. <laughs> um, but anyway. Um, so David asks, what was your rig back in the day then? And it was yes. behind us right now, isn't it? It is still there. That's the good thing. And <laughs> I kind of went into my little museum, which is... <laughs> What I, so I played that the rig was of course my famous guitar and I had another one and it is let me switch it on okay the first thing you can see this is not original there is a super switch that is or actually you broken and this switch maybe you can hear the difference it's brighter yeah, yeah. What, what did you install this for just to get a, a, a tonal shift a tone a mid a mid boost that yeah. turned my strat into a 335 mid focus. Okay, let's listen to that. So it 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 it, it is a, a mid boost uh, or mid shift that that made my strat sound more like the 335. Yeah, and here is my um, Clean 2B, what is it, M Channel B, I forgot, ah, and it has my original settings on there, man! <laughs> and by the way, this is the real deal, it is the big Acotronics Thirty kilogram tri Mark One with the uh, spring. Yeah. Then there is my M2, which is kind of a plexal plexi style. <laughs> Is more Hendrixy. switch only for the only, amp only one clean. Here. Yeah. only for clean okay yeah. and Sven says which mid frequencies exactly are boosted by this switch a this is a capacitor in the clean channel and i put another capacitor on top of that to widen the frequency would be around 600 hertz uh, with maybe we can go back It's, it's also kind of cutting the, the highs, yep. you know? As you can hear, there is something going on. Now the amp is alive on this channel. Two. Yeah. Well, 25 years. <laughs> huh? <laughs> B, which is actually Nunu Bettencourt's uh, favorite channel. I think the, 
best thing about this amp is the spring reverb. Yeah, and I don't know why it's ticking. Uh, let me see. Yeah, that's the amp one that's totally clean. <laughs> so just... Um, anyway, just for you guys, so you, you know these kind of 30 kilograms back in the day versus 1.2 kilograms today, how it sounds. It's not a real spring verb, you know. <laughs> the rattle is missing. Let's hear the triamp. You can tell that the, the reverb has something. And that's the uh, yeah. amp one. But if I wanted to, I could get really close. Well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh? Ah, it's, it's still. Now it's off. Yeah, I didn't match the tone, but. Um... If you ask me, M1 sounds better already. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... What about with the magic switch? Well, if I engage that, that's unbeatable, I'm yeah, sure. Exactly, because yeah. get this tone, I would have to use low gain mode because I have too much highs. But I can show you, I can get close easily like that. It's too hot now. Yeah. It takes me just a few seconds and we are there. The good thing is there's no magic. For me there is no magic anymore. Okay. Reverb are uh, here. So press and hold the boost button, dial back the volume. So now I can. And I go back for the triumph. So it has more ice now. I went too far. Okay. sounds so different. There's some spark, but... The Is that something you can only replicate with a genuine spring? Or... There's some digital kind of... There are some that get closer, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, it is a, a non-linear effect of the springs, yeah. which makes it hard in the, in the real world, in the, in the digital work to... to just listen to the M1 versus the Triumph. Has so much more difference. Triumph. And that's the M1. Yep. So there's a there's a lot more definition. And one 
versus try and it's just a, the reverb yeah, Hardy yeah. says he wants that reverb from the Triumph in the Ampex. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's some common ground here. Yeah, but um, was that your main tone then for tic tac toe, yeah. or were you more crunchy? No, no. I mean, I used all the channels. Yeah. I I I did what I always do. I I had my clean tones, I had my crunch tones, and I had my lead tones. Uh, so this this was kind of. Yeah, that's what. But you get the picture. Um, Is that a tone we could replicate on the Mercury? Sure. Let me. Okay, we can stiff a little. I would choose the little modern channel. There's nothing I miss from that Triumph. Yeah. The successor of the Mark I, the Mark II, I believe is even a little bit better mm -hmm. to my taste. And so the M1 is kind of more Mark II than Mark I. Yeah, okay. Ish. But hey, you know. Did you have a pedal board back in the day as well? Yes. Or? Yes. And hey, you are stuck. This is important. Uh, you are, we, we can show the case. This. <gasps> Yeah. Okay. This is the the top of my case. You can still see the where's the uh, here tic tac toe tour ninety seven. Is it upside down or is it no nope, right way up? Okay. I, I I don't see it. So here we go. Yeah. Herbst fall tour twenty third of September. Rock Sound was the rental company, and because playing tube amps. <laughs> I have modded my case top with a very special construction. There was a secret compartment and that compartment could be opened and there were spare MIDI cables and spare tubes. So yeah, you can, the case alone, just the case top alone has the weight of my current pedal board. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we have um, the, the Triumph in its own case, which is still sitting there, it's like, don't even try to carry it yourself. Uh, of course, back in the days I had um, a guy that was doing it for me. Yep. Ah, and over there you can see my, my quad over up here and the, and the foot controller. This, yeah, this one. So this was my programmable effects with Echoes, the good old Quadraver by Alesis. Um, and here you can see uh, the, there was A, B, C, D numbers for the backliner. Mm -hmm. So they, they knew 
this cable with the D goes in here and the D goes in there and you know so uh, to make it uh, bulletproof to to do the setup of the of the job and this was my foot controller good old Rockton all access 15 switches um, to recall presets and I had a Wawa pedal and basically that was it I had a uh, Maybe one boost pedal, I can't remember which one, but I, it wasn't too many. Probably one of my early ones, like the super duper hard on, super hard on. <laughs> yeah, that was my rig. Any questions? Did you only use Triumph? Uh, yeah, I, I think I had the Wawa pedal for sure, and I think that was it. The reason for that was I had, you know, kind of a programmable system mm -hmm. um, and my, my, my basic sounds came from the amp and uh, the rest was just giving me more uh, options, especially for delay times, which were needed for this pop music to, yeah. to be... And back during 97, you were doing this with tic-tac-toe, but you were also quite creative when it came to your own music. Sure. Releasing a record solo, yep. the second album, and also releasing the first album with your German language band, yeah. Dreist, Dreist, right? Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, tic-tac-toe, German language, I thought, you know, Dreist was, was, was out there before tic-tac-toe, but... Um, Let's let's maybe start with with my second solo record. We have a little clip that we can show you. And um, yeah, this this was the Electric Gallery, the album that came after the Beauty of Simplicity. Check that out. So that was Electric Gallery and basically that album was recorded with the band I was playing with uh, before Tic-Tac-Toe which was the Purple Schulz band. So I took the, the whole band except for Purple, the band leader and singer <laughs> and had a great band, you know, Wolf Simon on drums, Paul Harriman, English chap on bass and don't pay the hairy man. <laughs> <laughs> That's ah, another great thing. We have to we have to get Paul in here. Paul Harriman. I have to invite him as a guest. Paul is such a yeah, character and great, great guy. Killer bass player. Tone is in the fingers, even for bass. Ooh, unbelievable. Um yeah, Wolf Simon and Gerhard Silligen was the keyboard player. And oh Gerhard actually committed suicide a couple of years after this. I don't know what, yeah, musicians are... Um, well, how would you describe it? Like sensitive speeches, maybe. And um, some people that like my music are, and being into the puristic aspect of what I'm doing, they told me this is the best tone you ever had. And from my perspective, it's quite simple. It's that amp, <coughs> which is the amp that I also played in my German band, Dreist, a 50 watt Marshall, um, of course, non master volume, and um, I think I changed tubes to 5881 tubes that are a bit more vocal style, not as rough as the EL34s. 
And yeah, it's a magic amp. I had this with Max Carton, uh, the ACDC friend from Belgium, and he said, oh, yeah, that's very <laughs> good. Um, but I remember the, the magic, I recorded a lot with that amp, even other solo albums. And why do people say, that's the best tone? Well, I used that same amp on other al albums as well. And it's like, no, that's not your best tone. Uh -huh. hmm. Did I change the settings? Actually, no. Did I change the amp? No. Did I change the tubes? No. It was the same amp, but in the studio, I placed the mics magically on a nice spot of exactly this cabinet <laughs> we are sitting in front of. There are still, uh, there's still some marks here. <laughs> you know what? I can do the proof of concept picture. So you know how it looks like from our side. Doop. And we show this to the camera. Where's the camera? This camera. Can you see the marks? I always put circles around the mics. So I remember where I had good results. Um, but one of the main ingredients on the electric gallery is first, it's been recorded on real tape, the whole band and the guitar. Uh, do we have that picture with me in front of the 24 track? I think it was with a, a different guitar, with a Lac guitar, French guitar. Mm -hmm. But here, yeah, this, is, this is how it looked back in the days, the meter bridge of 24 tracks analog tape and um, maybe we can show the picture of the 50 watt plexi at my home studio I had another uh, this was Dreist and again the 50 watt plexi exactly that one you can see the the, the power yeah that that's that's again Dreist with with that amp on stage no power soak guys <laughs> like a real man but there's a, we should have a, a, another studio picture with me, this one. Ah. And in this picture, you can see the Wawa that I was using back then, that, which I still use. It's a George Dennis. And then uh, we can see the 50 watt on top is the one that I have here. And there's a 100 watt underneath, which is probably the... Uh, not the one here in the room right now. I have more. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we have Max Carton in the chat right now saying, great amp, oh, yeah. very aggressive. Yeah, very aggressive, but still uh, around everything. This amp has magic. I'm, I totally agree. Um, Can we by any chance hear that amp? Is it in the setup tonight? I'll try. Wait a minute, then it should be number three. Let's power it up. The power indicator died, well, but I think the rest is, let's see if it works. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here we go. This is... <laughs> Of course, cranked, yeah, everything kind of three o'clock, and that's it. <laughs>
So this is how the amp sounds uh, without any effects. Okay, if you listen to the record, the magic of the original spring, uh, no, plate reverb. I have two EMT plates, 250 plates, and I use them both. One is tube and one is transistor on this album. So the reverb again makes the magic besides my guitar and a good, it's a killer amp, you know. <laughs> If you want to check this with the amp one, let's go to clean, no boosts, and if we need volume first, <laughs> and then, uh, of course, no reverb. Too much gain. We have to go. Oops. Uh, uh. I thought the Marshall had died. No, it's number three. <laughs> that's the M1 and that's the Marshall. <laughs> put everything on five and we are closer because <laughs> this is what I want to sound. Yeah, very, very close. Um, yeah. But this is one of those special ones, as Max knows. Uh, yeah, talking about the other projects that I have done this year, yeah. which was the Electric Gallery uh, with, can, can I see the, 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 what was on the album? Still Alive, yeah, I played that, uh, you know. <laughs> Some licks that I should practice again. Um, ah, electric gallery. Uh, nice love crimes. I think I played that song. Yeah, blah blah blah. Nice, nice record. Uh, it's still available on our website, on the Blue Guitar website, store music. Yeah, and even some backing tracks in case you don't know the record. Yeah, links in the description. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the magic tone I was using purely because that was the concept of that amp. I wanted to be the real man that has nothing but just his guitar, a cable and his amp, crank and play. This was back in the days when I, I, I tried to be become a man. <laughs> And um, in Dreist, my German band, which is this thing, uh, um, we, we went into the studio and we released actually that album, which was our first official album. And on that album, I played that same amp. And we played many live gigs, as we have seen in the pictures with me. And that amp, with no power soak, just... I mean, when we played big stages, maybe we have the, the pic picture with a big stage. Um, 
uh, okay, this is, you can see that that um, 50 watt plexi uh, on a 4x12. This was on a big stage opening up for Deep Purple. Not a problem. But mainly we played small clubs and then a 50 watt without master volume is a problem. Yeah. That's when you needed that Tom Schultz power soak. I didn't buy it. I, I had a Rockman, <laughs> but I didn't have that. Yeah, uh, because I was a purist, you know. I knew that the Tom Schultz um, power soak was at least killing some of that high end, you know, finesse. Uh, always into that. Harryman plays this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Electric Gallery. Dreist. Mm. What's the time? Oh, yeah. 10 o'clock. Um, Going well. But it was a busy year. Oh, yeah. There was a lot to talk about. In, in, in that year, uh, the legal fight, the, it, actually, that was only the beginning of the legal fight. It took three years to get the money for, for playing with tic-tac-toe. Three years, you know. Any standard musician would have gone bankrupt, <laughs> <laughs> you know, paying your lawyers and not getting any money. Mm. And so I always had, like, different things going on. One was, like, um, doing the tour. The other thing was still being demonstrator with Jusen Kettner. Uh, then I was doing session work. Ah, by the way, there is the Ochsenknecht uh, CD here, which also came out that year. And I'm sure I've played on other albums uh, the same year too. Um, Uwe Ochsenknecht is a famous actor in Germany who also played on Das Boot, which is one of those um, World War II movies. He was one of those actors in the movie. Mm. And he's also a great singer. And this was his second record. The first one, my hero Peter Weyer played on it, and I played on that second album, besides uh, Gagi Mozek, who was the producer, and I don't know, some other... But I can hear my guitar all over the place on that record. Hundreds of guitar tracks. Back in those days, massive, massive. There's an extra here and there's an extra there and then we need that muted and then we do a stereo pen and then we have that one chord only with that on that bridge and ah, maybe arrange, do you have an idea for this part here? And then weeks. This was kind of going to the studio on a daily basis for maybe two weeks. Drive there in the studio, work, go home. In the end, they had a hundred guitar tracks. <laughs> and somebody had the pleasure of trying to mix something out of that. But, yeah, sounds expensive and was expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so for anyone who, again, is international, I guess they won't have heard this record, probably. No. Is there any specific song you might recommend they check out on YouTube or something? Das Tier, the, 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 the beginning song already. I played a solo on... Ah, I played... I think I played a Spiegelverkehrt solo. Uh, but Das Tier... Yeah, there's a nice cover version of... Um, I want to hold your hand by the Beatles. Come give me deine hand because the Beatles sang I want to hold your hand in German as well in the back in the 60s. And he took that into proper German, being a proper German. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe 
I have to find a way how to 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 get this um, um, out to you guys in a way, because there is some there is some there's some great guitar tones too. I I remember I played my Vox AC30 quite a bit on that album as mm -hmm. well, and my Marshall that one. And uh, can we get Uwe Ochsenknecht on the show, or is that maybe a a bridge too far? What do you reckon? The guy is a celebrity. I mean, are we talking... The, 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 I played with him afterwards. Um, in We had a band together called The Screen, which was uh, Mick Rogers of Manfred Man Earth Band, myself, Uwe, and the drummer and the bass player from Gary Moore when he passed away. Because the German promoter of Gary Moore had two unemployed people. <laughs> and so I said, you know what? I played with Ox, let's do a band. And he, he said, yes. So actually, there is, I think I have a little mobile phone video where we played, we pl played Lorelei and some other uh, places with Ochsenknecht. And uh, he actually sang on my arrangement of some Hendrix stuff. You'll never know. Um, if he's there, I don't know. Maybe he lives in. I think he lives in Austria at the at the moment, or in. You don't know. Yeah. Put on German t television, and you will see the guy. You'll he, see him somewhere. Yeah, yeah. He he's still around in movies. And if you. If you are international, look for Das Boot and there's Uwe Ochsenknecht uh, and Herbert Grünemeyer. There's like a bunch of very uh, famous German singing actors out here um, and they all were in Das Boot, at least these two. Yeah. Red Funnel 77 says, any plans for a new solo album? It's been a while. Oh yeah. Um, I always have plans, but no time. Um, I'm currently working with Ben Grenfeld on something and I <laughs> started to write this line when we This will be part of the I'm working on my complex part. <laughs> um, wonder if the band can play it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's I'm having fun with it. This is, yeah. I'm working on something. Yes, uh, that's the answer. Um, we might see something in the middle or by the end of the year. We already cut some tracks. Um, I'm not sure when we will release the final version. Um, as I'm so busy, Ben is busy, everybody busy. Um, so that that's that's coming, and it's um, it's proper guitar music. It's it, there's some instrumental stuff from my side that you. It's in that kind of tradition. Plus Ben, and then we do a lot of harmony kind of things, which is also great. Two guitars, woo, die singen and sägen. <laughs> and I work, uh, I, uh, um, I work out on lines that we play in harmony, which kind of go weird, because he, he played in Wishbone Ash. He, he came up with this, of course, well, he, he's inspired by that, what he has done for many years, for 10 years maybe. And then I played with Ben, and now I get inspired by this kind of um, writing lines for two guitars. Yeah, so this is what I do after 10 at night, sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> writing songs. Yeah, so there you go, original music mm -hmm. may be coming. Yeah. And just to sum up the thoughts about 97 then, it's 25 years ago now, you, you were active before. Would you say that that year in a way was kind of a highlight year in your career? Yeah, this was the highlight year 
of my pop career because, yeah, we haven't seen the big pictures of uh, the tour with uh, Michael Jackson, for mm -hmm. instance. I mean, we, we played a stadium tour with Michael Jackson op as opening act. We played uh, festivals in Switzerland before Sting, so I was backstage uh, looking at Vinnie Colaiuta like in, hey, and he playing his ass off, of course, the weirdest shit, totally relaxed. Um, so we, we met the guys um, and that was quite a good thing, but I was only the hired gun, um, already doing my own thing, but my own thing wasn't successful. But I had like the maximum success as a hired gun session player. Um, that was kind of the, the summit, the peak of what I could achieve. And after that, I decided it's good to split, you know, because it doesn't get any better than that. Can we see the pictures from tic-tac-toe uh, in front of 150,000 or 120,000? Wait a minute, no, this is the chart. So this is, can you see me in the middle? Um, yeah. This is playing stadiums. Um, and of course, my strat as always. And. Um, Did you meet Michael Jackson at any point? Sven asks. No, Michael Jackson had his separate entrance, which was covered uh, even with a black plastic uh, plane. Plane? No, uh, what is it? Plastic covered so nobody no daylight or no, nobody could see him so he had his separate bus coming straight on stage with his own elevator nobody even his band couldn't see him for the performance unless on stage we met uh, with the Michael Jackson band were there somewhere there are some photos I uh, yeah Jennifer Batten and them all uh, Yes, but uh, Michael Jackson himself, tic-tac-toe, the female singers, they met him um, at some press event. Mm. But this was without a band, so, you know, we were just the band. <laughs> were you the main support for him or were there other bands on the bill as well? No, no, this was us. Okay. I mean, um, there were a few other com uh, concerts that Michael Jackson played where... Sabrina Settlur was the opening act, and this was where Ali Neander played in. Ah, okay, yeah. So Ali and myself played the same year as in opening acts, so he was kind of in the other big German act with Sabrina Settlur. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it was a big year, and it, yeah, it was... It was a um, for me. It was something I I was hoping to achieve once in my life. I've been there. I've done it, and I'm totally relaxed about it. I could do it any other day because I know what it is. But actually, it's more about show and not so much about the music. And I'm in for the music. That's you know it. It's actually harder to play for two people than f in front of 200,000. Mm. It's more the stress that you have before you do the show. But if you are in, the, in a band like that, you are rehearsed, you do your show, there's a count in, and then you are automatic on autopilot. And then it's over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this question, I ask it with the greatest respect, but was there ever a point where you thought, or where you realized maybe, that what you were doing in your solo career was never going to be kind of on this, at least on this public arena level, and you, sure, I knew you that. made peace with that, or you sure. actively decided you didn't want the, the massive arenas? How no. was that in your head? It, that's a very good question. I mean, of course, when you're young, you want to get, you know, big, rich and famous and all that bullshit but once you've been there 
it's like if you once played a great guitar or something like that, it's a different thing. If you dream about it, it's like Christmas. I mean, there's more emotion before you get the Christmas present than once you have it. You know, it's like the moment you have it, it's great, but it's not that thing that you don't have, that you always wanted. And um, on the one hand, I always knew that my projects were not designed to be as huge and mass uh, music in a way. I've played so many productions that were designed to, to be uh, successful and targeting at a wider open uh, audience. Even though Tic-Tac-Toe was very special for these young girls um, I mean but they it it uh, it went to their hearts this 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 was you know Berger the uh, Thorsten was the producer and he knew because he he was doing productions before and he didn't he didn't make the point right. He had another project which wasn't so. So he was kind of trying to get this hundred percent, you know, bam, in the middle. And he he had years of doing that, never met, never getting it a hundred percent. And this is where he had to eat potatoes and sour cream <laughs> and nothing else. So this was, he he had no money, but he was he he was absolutely. Um, excited about getting to this point, you know, and he knew one day he will w maybe make that match. And finally, <laughs> he did. And yeah, uh, and then he made all the money in his life. And I think after this, he produced Falco and a Scorpions thing. Uh, because he was the hip producer and then disappeared and uh, probably retired in his late 30s, something like this, with enough money, of course. How many albums did they sell? I think 1.2 million of the first one. We had the charts there. Unbelievable numbers. Six million in total it was. I remember okay, from yeah. writing the text. Yeah, this. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, he made, he made enough. I think he was fine. Because he was the... He was the composer yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, had rights on the merch. T-shirts. I mean, you can have a 40-foot container before every concert. And then this was, I don't know how mon much money they made, yeah. you know. And I'm sure some of this money was also black cash. <laughs> <laughs> and an Aldi tüte, Aldi plastic bag wouldn't be enough. For him, <laughs> after the gig, I'm sure he went with a big smile and a lot of other stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But there you go. It, it didn't work out for the band in the end, and I guess for the guitar industry, it's a good thing because you got to doing this. Yeah. And of course, Christoph Kemper, he never made it into the band, so he made Kemper Profilers instead. And yeah, and we're all happy players now. Absolutely. I mean, this is the funny thing: is you know, paths can cross so many times with different. Um, uh, in d different situations, and it's cool, you know. I met Christoph Kemper in uh, in Nashville. We had a great time there, <laughs> you know. We, we, I even invited him to to join playing as a keyboard player, of course, because his guitar playing is not happening. But hey, you know, it's all it's all cool and uh, interesting people, interesting. Uh, yeah, we all do our things and there's, you know, 10 years ahead from now, nobody knows what we are doing, you know, it's, it's all open. But I have decided uh, on, I've been there in, in that industry and I didn't want to live there really because it's like, yeah, you have to you have to play a game as well. You know, you have to be the the smart guy and meet the 
expectations of the industry people and the artists and I had my weird jackets that looked and they, they were expensive you know jacket for 2000 uh, whatever Deutschmarks or something uh, one jacket of course you go you wear that to the party and then you you are cool but it, it didn't mean much to me it was fun the people are nice people are always nice this is you know the business and of course there are some weird people but most people are nice and it was a great experience but where's the beef there was not enough beef for me it was yeah it was too fluffy in a way <laughs> and so i kind of really decided after this um top slowly sneaking out starting my own things mm -hmm. Um, with my band Trist and with my solo career and forming my own band a couple of years later. This was all part of a journey that I don't regret at all and that my shift of being my own boss as a musician and now even as an amp, whatever, manufacturer or designer or sound designer or whatever they put on my business card. I have all kinds of descriptions on my business card. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there we go. That was 1997. Maybe in future we should do some other special years. Maybe when we reach the number of the Academy of Tone episode. But let's maybe just take a, a couple of questions for the yes. end. And there was one repeated question that came up. It's on a, a serious topic. Yeah. Of course, we all know what's going on in the world right now. And... Uh, Osmium Studios and Hardy both asked the question, the nanotubes from the AMP-1 are of Russian stock. Yeah. Are there any implications of that for future production of the AMP-1 or the AMP-X or anything else that yeah. we might be doing? Well, first of them, uh, first we have some here, not endless of course, um, getting troubles with international payments <laughs> first and shipments second makes it harder to get, but now we're talking politics. Um, we still can get those tubes through China because the Russians and the Chinese are still buddies in a way because, you know, I hate all that. And by the way, our, our tubes are not, tubes are so old, they are not used in any stuff anymore, in any military uh, equipment. That's, uh, it's only good for peaceful guitar amps. <laughs> Make music, not war. And um, yeah, try to get good information, not fake news. That's all I can say. It's hard for the Russians these days, I tell you. Um, but anyway, the, the point, and for us as, as well, because we don't know what we get. Back to the question, I'm not worried for several reasons. First, there are some that we will get, there are some that we still have, and um, there's alternative tubes in the Western world as well. They're just more expensive. Um, and if that doesn't work, I have other plans. Trust me, I'm not worried about that. So, um, yeah. So for me, easy peasy, you guys, don't worry. You will get what you get from Blue Guitar and it's, it's not a problem. It will be maybe interesting how things will work out. But this is, yeah, this is, uh, is my job. And actually it's a challenge sometimes, but I don't mind. It's like, I'm cool, at least for the next years, I think I'm cool. Yeah. Or we so are cool. All good yeah. on that front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, we're coming close to episode 100 of Academy of Tone in a Ooh, couple of weeks. Yeah, 100. Maybe, maybe some special stuff planned, maybe a few cool things to, to share with the guys. Oh, maybe yeah. not, they'll have to watch and see. Yeah, well, um, I think... I I will do a um, 
I will revisit what we've done in 100 episodes and maybe pick out some of my favorite moments or whatever. Um, yeah, that's that's something that comes to mind. But, um, you know, there's so much things we can do. Um, I am just had an email for next week, I think. Um, I have to, to finish the discussion if we do it or not. Um, it was a nice topic too, Joe Bonamassa. Uh, but Joe's not coming, right? No, Joe's he's not coming. Not, but he's coming, ah. to, he's coming to Saarbrücken he in, in April. Uh, he's not coming to this to show. Well, my plan would be we make a, we make next week we make an episode about Joe Bart Bonamassa. I met him twice. Uh, he will maybe remember nothing or only once. Um, and then let's see if he comes. I'm sure some guitar people are in connection and they can tell him, hey, Thomas, you're playing in his hometown. When I talked with Joe, when I met him in L.A., um, I talked with him about all the little clubs he played back in the days when he had only 17 euros for the entrance fee and, and stuff like that in the Schwarzart or oh, the Black Eagle. He remembered that, that stuff. Um, and as he's coming to Germany, I thought this would be a nice topic. I would like um, to do this with Fabian Ratzak because he, he knows his licks because he kind of... Uh, spent some time in analyzing it. Um, he sent me an email, maybe we have to change dates. That was the plan. Let's see. That might be next week, if not, uh, yeah, pretty soon. Yep, so cool things coming up. We've just hit 7,000 subscribers on the channel as well. Oh. So thanks, thanks, everybody. Hey, and for those guys who haven't subscribed yet, subscribe now. We, we never say that really because I always forget that. but. If you are a professional YouTuber, um, which we actually should be, <laughs> is we have to mention that. I mean, I'm a big fan of Rick Beato, and he says that twice in every episode. You exactly, know? and right at the start. We're doing it right at the end when everyone's already in bed. Maybe. Exactly. So next time we have to learn music theory from Rick Beato and how to promote a, a YouTube channel the right way, because he has more subscribers. <laughs> he has, just a few, yeah. yeah. But hey, thanks anyway for subscribing with uh, the Academy of Tone and the Blue, uh, Blue Guitar Guitar, uh, Blue Guitar, Blue Guitar 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 Guitar, I need an echo, 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 <laughs> uh, channel, YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. More echo? Um, I would have this pedal. It would be a looper. I can do it endless. <laughs> <laughs> Put in a mic and say subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. Endless loop. And just run it in the background at subliminal yeah. listening levels. And then crank it once a in a while. A common plan. I like it. That's, that's, that's professional. Mm -hmm. Okay, dog. Um, yeah, I think this was today's episode ninety-seven. About nineteen ninety-seven, a great year, and uh, we will do some more uh, for the future. Uh, oh man, pictures! Oh, unbelievable. Um, there's more stories, and there. I'm back to Peter Hayo, which I met the other day. We have to make a meeting about the funniest stuff that happened in studios, uh, about the weirdest experience. Unbelievable. I forgot about all that, you know? It's, it's kind of... But when I meet these people from the past, it's, it's all coming back and it's... We, we, uh, we have to. This is. These are the stories you have to to get as well. So I'm working on that. Get the authentic uh, guys in there, and then we should we just have maybe a round of beers and then start talking. Unbelievable stuff. <laughs> cool. So uh, thanks for today, and um, see you next week. Same time, same place. And uh, who knows who's who's be there? Who'll be there? 
Okie doke. Cheers. Bye-bye.